Hey guys, it's Metacosis Perfectionatus, where medicine makes perfect sense. Let's resume our biochemistry playlist. In previous videos, we started talking about the properties of the enzyme. Recall that most enzymes in your body are proteins. Enzymes are catalysts. They boost the speed of the reaction without getting changed by or consumed in the reaction. They lower the activation energy. They are sensitive to changes in pH and temperature. They are very specific. One enzyme for one particular reaction. Like a key in a lock. Like a truck in a dock. It has to fit. This is my biochemistry playlist. Please watch these videos in order. Enzymes are proteins and as you see, they came from amino acids. Enzymes are catalysts. They boost the speed of the reaction. They lower the activation energy, sensitive to changes in pH and temperature, specific for a particular reaction or set of reactions. They do not get changed or consumed by the reaction. They do not alter the equilibrium position. They do not alter the thermodynamics or the reaction's heat. They do not alter the overall free energy. As we have discussed in previous videos, enzymes provide a shortcut. However, they do not alter the origin or the destination. You're going the same way. You're reaching your destination. It just happens that you will reach it faster using a lower activation energy. As you see here, we have lowered the activation energy. The orange color is with enzyme, but the gray color is without an enzyme. The availability of the enzyme will make you require less activation energy than this. However, whether you go without an enzyme or with an enzyme, you are reaching your destination. Same final state. And when you measure the overall change of free energy, which is the distance between the initial state and the final state, it did not change whether you used an enzyme or no enzyme. Enzymes are specific. Please pause and review. There are six categories of enzymes as we have discussed in the last video. A kinase is an enzyme that adds a phosphate, but a phosphatase is an enzyme that removes a phosphate. Please recall that kinase is an example of transferases, but phosphatases are examples of hydrolases because they break down the phosphate in the presence of water. Now onto today's lecture. Here's the lovely enzyme. This is the active site, but you can also go through the back door, allosteric site. The front door and the back door are not the same. What's the purpose of the enzyme? It's a catalyst. Oh, so suppose that you started with substrate, let's call it A. A substrate is a substance that will bind the enzyme. And this enzyme will break down A into, let's say, B and C. So now I started with one substrate and I left with two products. The substrate is binding to the active site and not the allosteric site of the enzyme. This active site of the enzyme has a specific spatial arrangement. Notice that the substrate looks like a sphere and the active site also looks like a sphere. So that the substrate can fit into the active site of the enzyme, like a key in a lock, like a truck in a dock, like a finger in a glove. Doesn't that sound filthy? Sorry, just finished my urology rotation. This specific spatial arrangement, in this case a sphere, is important because it gives the enzyme its own specificity. All right, how can we stabilize this sphere-shaped active site? We have many mechanisms including ionic interactions, hydrogen bonding, and transient covalent bonds and these contribute to enzyme efficiency. There are two models or theories to explain the enzyme substrate interaction. The old one is the key and lock model. The new one, which is a better theory, more accepted nowadays, is the induced fit model. Let's start with the old model. Key in a lock, a truck in a dock, a hand in a glove, substrate into an enzyme and boom, that's it. Enzyme substrate complex. The shape of the substrate did not 
change. This is the shape of the substrate before binding, and this is the shape of the substrate after binding, same freaking shape. Similarly, the active site of the enzyme did not change its shape. This is the old model. Now let's turn our attention to the induced fit model, which hypothesizes that when the substrate binds to the active site of the enzyme, the substrate shape will change, and the enzyme shape will also change. Both are becoming complementary to each other. Think of it like your hand squeezing a rubber ball. Before your hand squeezed the rubber ball, the rubber ball was completely spherical. But after your hand squeezes it, it's not exactly a sphere anymore, is it? Nope, it has been indented by your own fingers. Moreover, your fingers are also changing shape because you are squeezing the ball. Oh, so the substrate is changing the enzyme and the enzyme is changing the substrate's shape. That's exactly right. Before binding, the enzyme was in the relaxed form, but after it's in the induced form. And then when the substrate leaves the enzyme, once again, the enzyme reverts back to the relaxed form. When the substrate is going in, it requires energy, therefore it's endergonic reaction. Look at this, going in requires energy, therefore endergonic. But when the substrate is going out, i.e. leaving the enzyme, there is no need for extra energy, therefore it's an exergonic reaction. It is true that chemical reactions may require catalysts known as enzymes. But what about cofactors and coenzymes? Well, just like a pilot might need a co-pilot, enzymes might require cofactors or coenzymes. What are the similarities first, and then what are the differences between cofactors and coenzymes? What is common? Both are not proteins. Both are present in the cell at low concentrations. If you need them, we can recruit more, raising the concentration of cofactors or coenzymes inside the cell. Just like Netflix on demand. Now, unto the differences. Cofactors versus coenzymes. Cofactors are relatively small. Coenzymes are relatively large. Cofactors inorganic. Coenzymes are organic. Cofactors include minerals. Coenzymes include vitamins. Look at my mnemonic. Cofactors are inorganic and they are minerals. Can you give me examples of each? Sure, cofactors, we're talking minerals. Calcium and magnesium, among others. If you want to add more, there is iron, there is copper, there is zinc, etc. Basically, the stuff in the periodic table, if you remember. Conversely, coenzymes are not in the periodic table. We're talking vitamins here, which include water-soluble vitamins, such as vitamin B and vitamin C, as well as the fat-soluble vitamins, vitamins A, D, E, and K, or, as I like to write it, KEDA, which is Arabic for thumbs up. These are your B vitamins, B1, B2, B3, B5, B6, B7, B9, vitamin B12, all of these are vitamin B, which means all of these are water-soluble. Since these are vitamins, they are coenzymes. I know that the word cofactor and coenzyme are used interchangeably, but if you want to get technical, vitamins are coenzymes. They are very important for chemical reactions, as we will discuss later when we talk about metabolism. But for now, please memorize that vitamin B2 is riboflavin and will give you FAD, but vitamin B3 is niacin, which will give you NAD. Please pause and review. If you want to be an excellent student, bring a blank piece of paper and write everything here down, preferably without looking at my slides. If you want to download my slides, you can download them at medicosisperfectsnetis.com as well as my general pharmacology course, my antibiotics course, my surgery high yields course, in the next video, we'll talk about enzyme kinetics and the michaelis menten graphs, which drives students nuts. But for now, please subscribe, hit the bell to get notified, and click on the join button. You can support me here or here. Go to my website to download my courses. Be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfect Snandus, where medicine makes perfect sense.